Good evening and welcome everyone. We are so happy you could join us tonight. My name is Lisa Bittney and I am the manager here in Tacoma Public Library. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Tense Transitions of Presidential Power with Mike Purdy. We are very excited to host Mike and to hear about historical transitions, especially as we're so close to an upcoming inauguration day. Mike Purdy is a Seattle-based presidential historian and a regular commentator on presidential history and politics for national and international news. He's worked with CNN, USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, Reader's Digest, BBC, and dozens of other media outlets. He's the founder of presidentialhistory.com, a resource that makes presidential history understandable and accessible to the public. He's also the author of the popular book, 101 Presidential Insults, what they really thought about each other and what it means to us. The book provides historical context to some of the inflamed passions between men who have served as president while also challenging us to work toward a more civil and respectful society. Mike's book is available through Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and also here at Tacoma Public Library. And now I would like to welcome Mike Purdy. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, for that introduction. Uh, good evening to all of you, uh, welcome. And thanks for joining me as we think together about the resiliency of our American democracy during transitions of presidential power from one presidential administration to another. I'd like to thank the Tacoma Public Library for asking me to speak with you tonight. Um, you know, little did any of us know when we were planning this lecture, just how tense and historically unprecedented this transition period from the presidency of Donald Trump to Joe Biden would be. Some of you watching tonight voted for Donald Trump while others voted for Joe Biden. We know that emotions are running high in our nation. If you voted for President Trump, you're understandably disappointed at the election results. I would encourage all of us to examine the facts surrounding this election as federal election experts, judges, and state officials across the country have done. They've all concluded we can have confidence in the integrity of our electoral process and the counting of ballots. Now, before I launch into my presentation, I'd like to ask John Hargis, the media lab instructor for the Tacoma Public Library, to just give us an overview of how the Zoom technology will work for tonight. John? Thank you, Mike. Our program tonight is in webinar format. In a webinar, participants are muted. Um, we will have a Q&A session immediately following tonight's program. And we encourage people to ask civil questions about our transition of power. And we hope to allow plenty of time for those questions to be addressed. So without much further ado, I see that Mike has found his uh, PowerPoint screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Mr. Purdy to continue the presentation. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, John. So while on one hand, January 6th, 2021, may be remembered by history as Insurrection Day, you know, perhaps we should more appropriately remember it as Democracy Day. It was a day when the framework and institutions of our great American experiment in self-government held against a violent attempt to overthrow it. Certainly there was tragic loss of life and our glorious Capitol building was desecrated when it was stormed, assaulted and pillaged, not by a foreign adversary as occurred in August of 1814 when British troops burned the building, but by domestic insurrectionists intent on overturning the results of a legitimate presidential election. 
It only delayed the certification of Joe Biden's election. Next time we might not be so fortunate. You know, violence has no place in American politics. As a nation, we have always been committed to the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the next. Now that's not to say that there hasn't been violence, but what has happened since the November election is without historical precedent. What I'd like to do tonight is to share with you some stories of some tense historical presidential transitions that really pale in magnitude to what we've been witnessing since the November 3rd election. I'll then summarize the current attempts to undermine the election results and, and why that is so damaging to our Republic. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of time for questions and comments I'd like to respond to at the end of the presentation. I wanna approach this subject under the framework of six major headings. Inauguration boycotts, delayed election results, violence, charges of fraudulent elections, a grudging transition, there were more than one, I'm only gonna share with you one, and then the 2020 election. One of the hallmarks of our democracy is the peaceful transition of presidential power. This is most visibly symbolized by the presence of the incumbent president at the inauguration of their successor. As the third presidential election loomed in 1796, the big question on many minds was whether George Washington, considered indispensable to the foundation and success of our fledgling Republic, would stand for election for a third time. He declined and his vice president, John Adams ran and became president. It was the first peaceful transition of presidential power. But in 1800, Adams, who had lived in the White House for just four months since its completion, was defeated by his vice president, Thomas Jefferson, for another term as president, but only after some electoral drama. So Jefferson and Aaron Burr were tied with the most number of electoral votes for the Electoral College. They each had 73 votes. Adams trailed them with 65 electoral votes. So the election of president was thrust upon the House of Representatives where each state had one vote. But it was not until two weeks before the March 4th inauguration day that the House on its 36th ballot finally selected Jefferson as the new president. Jefferson was surely right when he privately confided that Adams was excessively vain. Now that vanity was on full display as March 4th, 1801, Jefferson's inauguration day approached. Adams was so humiliated at his loss that he became the first of three presidents to boycott attending his successor's inauguration. Now we'll soon have a fourth president joining this exclusive club of petulant presidents. At 4 a.m. on inauguration day, while it was still dark outside in Washington, D.C., the sullen John Adams quietly slipped out of the White House without fanfare and boarded a public stage to return to his home in Massachusetts. It was too much for him to witness his former friend but now bitter rivals electoral victory over him. But it was a peaceful transition of presidential power. Like father, like son, when John Quincy Adams was defeated in 1828 for a second term in the White House by Andrew Jackson, he too chose to boycott the inauguration of his successor, Andrew Jackson. He bested his father by leaving 
the White House in the evening of March 3rd, 1829, whereas his father had stuck around till 4 a.m. on inauguration day, and he chose not to witness Jackson's inauguration. Now, there was a lot of animosity between Adams and Jackson, stemming from a highly controversial and contested election just four years earlier, in which Adams had prevailed over Jackson through a vote by the House of Representatives, just less than a month before Inauguration Day. In the 1828 rematch that Jackson won, Adams was gracious in trying to have a smooth transition, but Jackson rejected his overtures for assistance, but it was a peaceful transition of power, despite Adams skipping town before Jackson took the oath of office to succeed him. Andrew Johnson, who had succeeded to the presidency upon the assassination of Abraham Lincoln in 1865, failed to obtain the nomination of the Republican Party to run for president in his own right in 1868. Instead, they se selected Civil War hero Ulysses Grant as the standard bearer for the party. Grant won the election, but there was no love lost between Johnson and Grant. During Johnson's impeachment trial, Grant confided to one senator about Johnson that, quote, I would impeach him if for nothing else, because he is such an infernal liar. Johnson had a prickly and volatile personality and he boycotted attending Grant's inauguration, choosing instead to remain at the White House to sign legislation. In our day, we expect election results instantaneously, but as we saw in 2020, some states are slower than others in counting ballots, especially since there was an unprecedented number of votes. We still knew the winner was Joe Biden within days. But there have been elections in the past when the winner was not known until shortly before the inauguration. So we've already discussed how the results of the 1800 election were not known until just two weeks prior to the inauguration day. And we've seen that the results of the 1824 election were not known until a little less than a month before Andrew Jackson took the oath of office. I wanna discuss two other elections where the results were delayed. In the election of 1876, Republican Rutherford Hayes trailed Democrat Samuel Tilden in the popular vote. But as we well know, it is the votes of the Electoral College that officially elect the president. In 1876, there were disputes about which candidate had actually won in South Carolina, Florida, and Louisiana. As it turned out, each of these states sent conflicting electoral votes or slates of electors to Congress. After much debate, Congress decided to create an electoral commission to determine which candidate had won each of these three disputed states. And if you watch some of the um, debate about certifying Joe Biden's election. There were some folks who were suggesting an electoral commission again, and they talked about the 1876 election. But the fact pattern is very different in that in 2020, we had all of the states submitting just one slate, whereas in 1876, these three states that I mentioned in the South each submitted uh, conflicting slates of electors. The resulting decision of the commission awarded the electoral votes strictly along partisan lines to Rutherford Hayes, who narrowly bested Tilden 185 to 184 electoral votes. But the final decision on who would be the next president wasn't made until March 2nd 1877, just two days before the official March 4th 
1877 Inauguration Day. But because March 4th fell on a Sunday, and because of concerns of assassination threats against Hayes, he was privately inaugurated on March 3rd, and then took the oath again in a public ceremony on Monday, March 5th. I'm not gonna dwell a lot on the election of uh, 2000 as it's history that most of us have lived through. As we know, however, the final decision about the, the winner wasn't determined until December 12th, a little more than a month after the election, when the US Supreme Court stopped the recount in Florida, ensuring that George W. Bush carried the state by 537 votes over Al Gore. In his concession speech, Gore said that, quote, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. It was the fourth time that a president was elected after losing the popular vote, but carrying the electoral college. Political passions often run high as we witnessed last week. Unfortunately, such violence or threats of violence are peppered throughout the history of presidential transitions. I've already commented on the threats to Rutherford Hayes in 1877 and want to tell a few additional stories. As the United States was unraveling in the months before Abraham Lincoln's March 4th, 1861 inauguration, there were credible reports of a plot to assassinate the president-elect on his way to Washington, D.C. to take the oath of office. The intelligence information revealed that Lincoln would be assassinated in Baltimore as he changed trains. Lincoln was convinced to change the route and the timing of his train so he would arrive in Baltimore in the middle of the night. He also disguised himself, which is a somewhat difficult challenge for a man six foot four inches tall. The change of plans of course worked and Lincoln was inaugurated and led the nation through the challenging civil war years with grace and wisdom. We can only speculate how history might have unfolded differently had Lincoln been assassinated before his term began and Hannibal Hamlin, the vice president elect became president. 17 days before Franklin Roosevelt's first inauguration in 1933, at the height of the Great Depression, there was an assassination attempt on FDR's life. Roosevelt was in the back seat of an open car in Miami and had just given a speech. The mayor of Chicago was standing on the sideboard of the car. Shots rang out and five people were hit. The Chicago mayor later died of his wounds, but Roosevelt emerged unscathed from the attack. In yet another of history's what ifs, we wonder how history would have unfolded without Roosevelt as president for more than a dozen years. Sadly, election fraud or charges of it are nothing new in American politics. We've already discussed the election of 1876 that put Rutherford Hayes in the White House based on political decisions of awarding electoral votes from him to him from three disputed Southern states. I wanna look at two other examples. In the election of 1824, none of the four major candidates obtained a majority of the electoral college votes. The leading figures were John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. While popular voting was still in its infancy and not all states had popular votes, Jackson beat Adams in both the popular vote and had 99 electoral votes to Adams 84 votes. The decision then fell to the House of Representatives with each state having one vote. 
Henry Clay threw his support to Adams and Adams won. When Adams subsequently appointed Clay as Secretary of State, Jackson's supporters were incensed and they cried, corrupt bargain, implying that Clay had um, traded his influence to become Secretary of State, which was viewed as a stepping stone to the presidency. John F. Kennedy won the presidency over Richard Nixon in 1960 by a narrow popular vote margin of 112,000 votes. Rumors persisted, however, of fraudulent voting in Illinois, where Nixon lost by just 9,000 votes. And there were concerns about the Chicago machine of Richard Daley um, changing votes, and Texas, where Lyndon Johnson was strong. Um, and Nixon lost by 46,000 votes. If Nixon had won those states, it would have been enough to win the Electoral College. Nixon confided to a journalist friend about the potential fraud that, quote, our country cannot afford the agony of a constitutional crisis. He chose not to dispute the election. I want to give one example of a grudging transition, um, not to say that there haven't been others. Um, it, you know, Donald Trump joins 10 other sitting presidents who have been defeated for re-election, and it was not fun for any of them. At the height of the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover was electorally evicted from the White House by Franklin Roosevelt, a man who had once been one of Hoover's biggest fans. Hoover harbored feelings of humiliation at his defeat. After FDR's runaway election victory over President Hoover, the president-elect paid a visit to Hoover in the White House to discuss transition issues. Hoover was not impressed with his successor. He groused privately that FDR was, quote, a gibbering idiot. Unlike John Adams, at least Hoover showed up for FDR's inauguration, but it wasn't a comfortable encounter. Hoover dreaded the day. The president-elect's car pulled up to the White House to pick up the president for the ride down Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol where FDR would take the oath of office. Hoover greeted FDR before getting in the car, but there was an awkward tension in the air as the two former friends and colleagues, but now bitter rivals, sat in the back seat of an open convertible with their shoulders just inches apart. They barely spoke to each other on the short trip. FDR flashed his famous smile to the crowds lining the street while, while an unsmiling <clears throat> and petulant Hoover awkwardly endured what he viewed as a very public humiliation. At the conclusion of Roosevelt's inaugural address, Hoover rose, perfunctorily shook the new president's hand, and left immediately for the train that would take him to his political exile in New York City. It was the last time they ever saw one another. We've had presidential transitions in the past that have been very tense. But I want to be clear that from a historical perspective, the transition from Donald Trump to Joe Biden has no precedent. Regardless of whether you love or hate President Trump, the facts of the aberrational nature of this transition speak for themselves. I want to quickly review just some of what we are witnessing in this transition. The president manufactured claims of election fraud even before the election. The president encouraged voters to vote twice by mail and in person. More than 60 lawsuits by the president were all tossed out by both Republican and Democratic judges 
as having no evidence of election fraud, and that included the US Supreme Court. The president refused to commit to a peaceful transition of power. The president has not congratulated or spoken with President-elect Joe Biden. The president has not invited Biden to the White House to be briefed. The president delayed releasing funds for the transition effort of the president-elect. The president delayed and then later blocked meetings between his administration and that of president-elect Biden. The president attempted to improperly influence state governors, secretaries of state, and legislators to ignore the election results in their states, certify a victory for him, and appoint electors loyal to President Trump, despite having lost those states. The president encouraged members of Congress to vote against accepting electoral votes from key swing states. The president encouraged Vice President Pence to act beyond his legal authority as president of the Senate and reject the electoral votes of key swing states. With his false narrative of a stolen election, the president incited his supporters to attack the US Capitol in an effort to delay and overturn by force the counting of electoral votes by Congress. Former President George W. Bush said, quote, this is how election results are disrupted in a banana republic, not our democratic republic, end of quote. The president's role in the attack on the Capitol, of course, resulted in his second impeachment by the House of Representatives yesterday. The president has refused to concede. Now, under duress from his staff, he did offer a weak acknowledgement that a new administration would take office on January 20th, but only after the assault on the Capitol. The president's advisors, such as Michael Flynn, have encouraged the president to declare martial law, suspend the Constitution, and have the military conduct new elections. The president has announced he will not attend the inaugural ceremonies of his successor. He will be the fourth president to boycott the inauguration of his successor. The president's false claims and incitement of his supporters into believing his wishful thinking that the election was stolen from him when he has not presented any such evidence undermines the integrity of our democracy and electoral process and leads many people astray. We need to remember that truth is important, not simply wishful narratives promulgated by the president and some media outlets that have no basis in fact. We need to acknowledge that the words of the president mattered. The transition from Donald Trump to Joe Biden is clearly the most tense transition of presidential power this nation has ever witnessed. My plea is that all of us, whoever we voted for, would treat our fellow citizens with civility and respect, and we would embrace objective truth and facts as we attempt to heal our land and lower the emotional rhetoric of our times. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Um, Lisa, what questions have come in? Thank you, Mike. That was really interesting. And just to reiterate to everyone, um, in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen, if you click on the Q&A, you can enter in questions that we're going to ask of um, Mike. Um, I have a couple to get us started with. Um, the first question I have tonight 
how can we best discuss the inauguration and its importance with those who in their hearts do not feel that our election was legitimate? You know, that's such a great question because what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the, um, the there, there are, in my opinion, um, in the opinion of judges and, and, and courts and election officials, everybody has said this was a fair election. Um, and, and so we've got a lot of people in the country who are getting their news, getting their anger from what the media is saying and what President Trump is saying. And so I guess the best way to engage people on the question is to say, let's talk about it. Let's talk about, tell me what you think the facts are about why you think this was a stolen or fraudulent election and, and try to have that conversation based on real information, not just uh, a, a narrative that's been created um, out of thin air. Um, it, it's an incredibly difficult question. Um, we, we, have, we have people who are living in two different worlds because we're getting information from different sources. And some of that information is fact-based and some of it is not. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge that we all face, certainly. Mike, I'm seeing a question from Michael Ayer. Er, um, Michael asks, thanks, Mike, big fan of yours. So a lot of Republicans are saying that we need to simply move on from this moment and unify. However, others are arguing that there needs to be some kind of reckoning or accountability before that unifying can begin. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, the, the, the that, you know, frames the question very well, I think. Uh, hello, Michael, uh, good to hear from you. And I, I think that we, the House of Representatives impeached the president a second time um, because of accountability. I think behind that uh, attempt by the House, it's also, um, there's a desire by some to have a separate vote as part of the impeachment vote when it gets to the Senate that would permanently bar Trump from ever holding federal office again. Now, we don't know what the Senate is going to do. Uh, the Senate would need 17 Republicans to jump ship. And there's you know, a half dozen or so right now that uh, already we could see might end up doing that. Um, and, and there's some others there who may end up saying, yeah, it would be nice to not have to deal with Donald Trump in the future. So on the one hand, we've got accountability and, 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 and going on record firmly that there are consequences to actions. And I think that's what the House of Representatives did. And this was a bipartisan, 10 Republicans who voted in the House to impeach the president. Um, on the other hand, you have many Republicans now who are saying, oh, it's time to unify. And I think part of the challenge is where were these Republicans for the last four years about unification when they were simply following Trump's party line? There is some anecdotal evidence um, that some Republicans in the House of Representatives wanted to vote for impeachment. They felt like uh, the president should be impeached. It was an impeachable offense, but they are quite frankly uh, fearful for their lives and the lives of their families. Um, Vice President Pence is in some danger because he chose to uh, stand up to Trump and to say he had no legal authority to overturn the results of the Electoral College. And so when the insurrectionists were going through the Capitol, um, 
last week, um, there were cries of, you know, where's Mike Pence? And they wanted to find him and hang him. So there is a real threat of physical violence to Republicans who end up saying, yes, we should impeach the president, we should remove him from office, we should prevent him from being able to hold office in the future because uh, Donald Trump has stirred up a, a, a group of people um, toward violence. So it, it's a very difficult situation. Okay, thank you, Mike. We have a question from Ernest here who asks, is the electoral college still useful or out of date? in 2021? Yeah, I think the Electoral College was out of date a long time ago. Um, it, you know, the Electoral College came about um, at the founding of our nation with the Constitution as a compromise um, that small states didn't want to lose their influence. Small states with uh, uh, low population bases. And, and so that was the compromise that was reached. That still holds true today that those small states, Wyoming, Montana, you can think about those states that have very few, um, uh, very small population, very few electors, and they don't want to lose their influence. And, and, and they would view the, um, the abolition of the electoral college as um, a decrease in their power in national politics. And it's true that would happen because Wyoming has, you know, uh, I, I think fewer uh, voters than the city of Seattle does, uh, but they've got three electoral votes and, and they don't want to lose that. But, you know, most nations um, and, and what we are most used to even in this country, other than presidential elections, we're most used to whoever gets the most number of votes overall should be president. So I don't think it's useful. I don't think in this current political environment, we are likely to see it being abolished. It would require a constitutional amendment. There, um, there's a couple of workaround um, things to the Electoral College. One is that uh, there's something called the National uh, Interstate Voter Compact, where a number of states have, through their legislatures, passed legislation saying that when there are enough states who pass similar legislation, uh, this uh, compact would go into effect. And what the compact would say is that those states would agree to award all of their electoral college votes to the winner of the national popular vote. So there's maybe a dozen plus states that have agreed to this so far. Um, they're not up to uh, states representing 270 electoral votes yet, um, mainly because the, the states that have agreed to this are primarily democratic leaning states. And again, Republican leaning states are not gonna be in favor of it. The other workaround is that uh, just like Maine and Nebraska uh, don't award all of their electoral votes to the winner of the state, but they award it by congressional district. So this is something, um, you know, how the electoral college votes are awarded by states is up to each individual state. So uh, individual states could uh, change their policies instead of a winner take all, because right now you can have, uh, let, let's pick on Arizona. Um, let, let's say Joe Biden had won Arizona by one vote. Well, he would have gotten all of Arizona's electoral votes. So states could go to a congressional basis or they could go to a proportional basis. Um, again, this is a big um, uh, battle, I think, between uh, small states and large states between urban and rural. And, and we're likely to continue to see that for a while. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, Terry asks, impeachment is such a political process. 
What other avenues may be used to discipline the president for his actions on January 26th? And Jennifer would like to know what the role of previous vice presidents have been in the impeachment process. So what other steps can be taken um, to deal with the president? Um, uh, Congress could um, vote to censure the president, which is simply saying you did a bad thing. It has no uh, legal impact. It doesn't remove a president from office. And you know Donald Trump is not going to be removed from office through impeachment because the Senate, um, uh, according to Mitch McConnell, who still controls the Senate, has said they're not going to take up a trial until January 19th at the earliest. Um, so censure is a possibility. Um, obviously, impeachment. Uh, it, it becomes kind of an interesting conundrum of uh, voting to remove the president from office when he's already out of office. We've never had that happen before. Um, and, and I think many people are looking at this impeachment effort as an effort to um, uh, bar him from holding federal office in the future. So in the impeachment clause in the Constitution, it talks about removal from office and banning them from future federal office, but that would need to be two separate actions by the Senate. Um, and the, the second part of the question was role of vice presidents. Um, not sure I totally understand the question. In, um, the, the, the vice president would, um, I mean, technically the vice president is the uh, president of the Senate, so they preside. Now come January 20th, the Senate is going to be uh, evenly divided between elected senators 50-50 and Vice President Kamala Harris will then cast the tie-breaking vote on anything that comes before the Senate. Uh, but that's the only time that she could vote. So if you, know, you need 67 votes for conviction of impeachment, uh, you know, she's not going to have a voting role in that. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question from um, Jenny and Jack, who are big fans of yours. Hey, Jenny. Can you, can you give some examples of how new presidents have addressed tension and controversy after taking office? They're thinking of um, how Ford pardoned Nixon. Yeah, I mean, that's the greatest example that, you know, when Gerald Ford became president after Richard Nixon's um, resignation, uh, Ford quickly saw within the course of a month that all of his time was being consumed with the, um, the, the Nixon issue and what should happen to the former president. And he decided that in order to move the country forward, that it was best to uh, offer him a full and complete pardon so the nation could move forward. That is a question that Joe Biden is going to face. Um, well, a couple of issues backing up. Uh, high likelihood that uh, President Trump may test the bounds of the pardon power of the Constitution, and he may try to self-pardon himself. Uh, that's never been tested, that's never been done. And so we don't know whether that's really going to be um, effective. Uh, and if, if it were challenged in the courts, where would that go? We don't know. You know, my sense is that Joe Biden is probably going to take a, uh, a hands-off position of it and allow his Justice Department to proceed based on facts. But clearly, we have um, an amazingly divided country. And that is going to impact uh, President-elect Biden's ability to accomplish anything. So he may be faced with the same issue that um, Gerald Ford was faced with. And you know, if he cho chooses to pardon Donald Trump, I think there would be um, an even bigger outcry than occurred when Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon. 
Um, I, I mean, I think if you look at the nature of the things that Richard Nixon did versus the nature of the things that Donald Trump has done, um, you know, Nixon looks like a choir boy. Um, you know, it's not to say that he didn't do bad things, but uh, it, it's just a very different scale. Okay, thank you. Well, we're going to go back into some history with this one. Um, Chris asks, did Hayes strike a bargain in 1877 to swing the Congressional Committee his way? Yeah, so what happened in 1877 with the Electoral Commission, there were um, five members appointed from the House, five from the Senate, and five from the Supreme Court. It was um, evenly divided, uh, seven to seven, Democrat versus Republican, and one independent on the Supreme Court. That independent member resigned and was replaced by a Republican. And as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the Electoral Commission decided to award those contested electoral votes purely along partisan lines. There was some um, bargain struck that Hayes would remove federal troops from the South. Uh, this was during Reconstruction. And um, so that was part of the bargain that happened. It, it was a horrible, messy election. Um, never should have happened that way, but it did, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, here's another question. Has any other president faced such big challenges? For example, a deadly pandemic, a shuttered economy, deficits, racial unrest, unrest that reveals a caste system based on white supremacy, infrastructure, climate change, and a fiercely divided country. Any recommendations from history on how to overcome those challenges? Great question. So, you know, of that list, you know, I don't think there are any direct parallels to that list, but I would point to two uh, presidents who took office in um, some pretty dire circumstances. One, Abraham Lincoln in 1861. Uh, so the Union was disintegrating. Southern states were seceding from the Union. And um, it, it was a pretty traumatic time. Secondly, would be 1933 when Franklin Roosevelt took office at the height of the Great Depression. And, and, and so there, there's a lot of parallels there in terms of economic collapse. So we've got economic collapse now. Uh, we didn't have a pandemic then. Um, I mean, we've got a, a, a number of issues all coming together now that we didn't have in any of these other transitions. But in, in terms of um, how bad things were, I'd look to 1861 and to 1933. And so what are the examples we can learn from those? Um, well, Abraham Lincoln, uh, of course, famously selected a cabinet um, who consisted of men who had run for the presidency against him, the, the team of rivals. And, um, and, and so he brought in a lot of disparate viewpoints to help him manage this crisis. Lincoln was also just an incredibly wise man. He was the right man for the times, just as Franklin Roosevelt was the right man for the times. Franklin Roosevelt um, decided to um, take bold action. He made a statement, it was actually during the 1932 campaign that, you know, if they, if one thing didn't succeed, that he wanted to try something new, it, it, that the nation required bold experimentation. So you've got Lincoln and FDR as very strong and politically savvy leaders who were able to lead us through some very difficult times. So Joe Biden is a very experienced hand. He's been around for a long time. He knows the ins and outs of Washington, D.C. like probably nobody else. 
Um, Joe Biden is also um, a person who wants to try to bring people together. That's one of his biggest gifts is um, trying to bring folks together, reconciliation, compromise, and, um, and, and to not inflame a situation further. So um, Joe Biden has a very, very serious task in front of him. Um, but I think just as Lincoln was the right man for the times in 1861 and Franklin Roosevelt in 1933, I think Joe Biden is the right man for 2021. Great, thank you, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, another question, Rick is wondering, have there been any significant impacts to governance over rocky transitions? What about foreign relations? Um, you know, the one thing that comes to my mind, well, two things that I'll talk about. One, I'll go back to 1933, the, the uh, Great Depression. And uh, during that period of time, you had Herbert Hoover reaching out to FDR to try to get him to agree to certain actions. And FDR said, no, I'm not the president. Uh, we only have one president at a time. And, and I think behind that, there was also a political ploy. And that is that, that the worse things would get, the better he would look in terms of being able to solve problems. Um, so, so that did, the, the Rocky transition did impact things. I mean, there was really more than the Rocky transition with the difficult times we lived in. In 1968, there were charges that uh, Richard Nixon was um, uh, taking some actions, uh, and, and I don't have the, all the details on the top of my head, to um, basically impact some foreign policy with respect to Vietnam. And, um, and you know, LBJ knew about this and uh, chose not to raise that. Um, but, but some people have said that Nixon was kind of borderline traitor. You know, the transition period between presidents is, um, is a very vulnerable time for the country, especially if there has not been good cooperation and good transition and good information being passed from one administration to the other. And it's a time that our foreign adversaries can take advantage of things that are going on. Um, so we do need to be on high alert. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Stacy says, I'm hearing a lot of varying information about what the second impeachment does. Everything from preventing Trump from holding office again, to removing his ongoing Secret Service protection and other ongoing post-presidential benefits that cost taxpayer. Can you clarify what this second impeachment could do? Sure, so um, it, it's obviously not going to remove him from office. The Senate doesn't take up a trial until uh, January 19th. Uh, it's not gonna get voted on by the Senate. So uh, it's not gonna, he is going to be president until January 20th. Um, with respect to Secret Service Protection, um, the, the, the Secret Service Protection Act for former presidents, um, as, as I understand it, says that, you know, a former president continues to receive those benefits and, and Trump would be a former president. Um, what's less clear in my mind is whether that impacts pensions or not. Um, and I just don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. Um, Soren's gonna test your historical knowledge here. Grover Cleveland is the only president to attend four inaugurations, um, 1885 on his way in, 1889 on his way out, 1893 on his way in again, 1897 on his final way out. Were there any issues related to his various transitions? Yeah, great question. So um, Grover Cleveland is the only president uh, who has served two non-consecutive terms. So he was our 22nd and our 24th president. 
so he won as the 22nd president. And then uh, in the next election, um, he won the popular vote, but Benjamin Harrison won the electoral college vote. So Cleveland was out of office. And then uh, Cleveland came back in a rematch with Harrison and Cleveland won the electoral college. Um, I am not aware of any transition issues that came up um, based on those various transitions. Um, not to say that there weren't, but they, I, I don't think they, they rose very high if there were. I mean, there's always going to be transition issues. But I think one of the things that um, 2020 has shown us, and actually the entire presidency of Donald Trump has shown us, is that a lot of our institutions rely upon the goodwill of the person who is president. Uh, that there's a lot of things that aren't in the law, but we just expect people to do the right thing. And, uh, and by and large, presidents have done the right thing. Yes, we've had some presidents who have boycotted the inauguration of their successor um, which, you know, I think is poor form um, because part of what we want to do is we want to say that we are um, acknowledging the peaceful transfer of power. But uh, I, I, I'm not aware of any issues with the Cleveland transitions. Okay, thank you. Um, so we're now going to play What If and Rewrite History here tonight. Uh, Rick, Rick is wondering, what do you think would have happened if Nixon had challenged the results in Illinois? Oh, gee, that's a great question. <laughs> so there would have uh, had to have been a, a lot of investigation. So like I said, 9,000 votes in Illinois, charges that Chicago Mayor Richard Daley was pulling strings, having you know, dead people vote in alphabetical order um, and things like that. Did that tip the scales? We know that Texas where LBJ was from, uh, LBJ was a master at electoral manipulation. Uh, he had some very questionable uh, races uh, where the voting was probably fraudulent. Uh, what would have happened if Nixon had challenged it? Um, I, I guess there probably would have been some kind of an investigation. Um, whether those investigations produced any change, you know, I think is doubtful um, because you have LBJ controlling um, certain counties in Texas. You've got Richard Daley controlling Chicago. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. I think Nixon realized that that wouldn't happen. Um, you know, had Nixon you know, successfully challenged it and uh, people found out the fraud, assuming there was fraud and it's not a foregone conclusion there was, but speculation, um, you know, obviously our history would have looked very, very different with Nixon as president, no JFK assassination, no Watergate, or maybe something similar. I mean, who knows what we can, spin our minds wildly about uh, those what ifs. Okay, well, thank you, that was fun. Yeah. Um, we, we're, we've got time for one more and we're, we're gonna finish up with, um, we're gonna ask you for a prediction. Uh, <laughs> Karen and Howard are interested in learning from you. Is violence probable on January 20th? Oh, gee. Um, I mean, the FBI is warning us and warning state uh, individual states that there's likely to be violence at state capitals and in Washington, D.C. Um, in Washington, D.C., they have shut down the, um, the mall um, because of fears of violence and they've shut down streets around there. Um, you'll note that um, I, you remember I talked about the, the plot against Abraham Lincoln when he's traveling by train to his inauguration. Uh, Joe Biden was planning to take the train from Wilmington to Washington, D.C., just like he did for decades as uh, a senator. And because of security concerns, that has now been scrapped. 
Um, so I think it is a real risk. I don't think that the electoral violence um, that occurred last week has changed um, the minds of any of the people who were responsible for it. And so I think it is a real risk. I think that at least in Washington, D.C., that they are a little bit more prepared. There are some 20,000 National Guard who will be on duty there. Um, that's a pretty significant force. So uh, insurrectionists would need to have a lot more people on hand. But, you know, Donald Trump has stirred up a lot of passions. Um, and, and, and so that's possible. I think the, the bigger risk is probably in state capitals who don't take the FBI's warning uh, seriously enough and don't really beef up their security. So, yeah, I think it is a real possibility. You know, we, we, we've seen it unleashed last week, and I think that's going to be hard to put that genie back in the bottle. Okay. Um, I know I said that was the last question, but I think I'm wrong now because after that, I feel like I have to ask the final question from Bertha, who says, do you believe that our nation can heal after this? That's a great question. You know, I, I think that the words of the president um, make a difference. And we've seen in our history, both positive and negative examples of that. Um, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was inspirational. John F. Kennedy was inspirational. Ronald Reagan was inspirational. Their words made a difference. Um, Andrew Johnson was belligerent and a racist and said things that were intemperate. Um, Donald Trump has done similar things. I think the president sets a tone my, my big concern is that, you know, even with Trump out of office, even with Trump um, banned from social media, that something has been unleashed and um, people are very angry and it's going to take a lot to bring about healing. I don't think that everybody who voted for Donald Trump is an insurrectionist or who or believes in violence. But I think it's going to take some deliberate efforts to try to bring our nation together again. So one of the things I just comment on is, um, and, and Lisa, you mentioned this in the introduction, talking about my book which, you know, 101 presidential insults, what they really thought about each other and what it means to us. So it's kind of a funny, shocking book, what presidents have said about each other. And this has happened forever. Uh, Trump has, you know, upped the ante quite a bit, not only against former presidents, but against anybody who crosses his path. But what I tried to talk about in the introduction is the importance of civility and that we need to, as a nation, um, try to come together. I, I think Joe Biden, um, again, like I said, I think he's got a huge task in front of him. And um, because we've got so much dissent and so many people who are upset with how things are going, they don't feel like they're getting a fair shake. Um, can we heal? Yes, I think we can. I think it will take time though. Okay, Mike, thank you. Thank you so much. And I wanna thank everyone who came to our program today. Um, we had a lot of great questions in the Q&A and um, unfortunately we weren't able to get to all of them. So I encourage everyone to, um, connect with Mike at his website and it's presidentialhistory.com. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. Okay. And he'll have his email address there and you can connect with him. And Mike, thank you so much for um, your thoughtful answers to all of our questions. Um, thank you for letting us just kind of put you on the spot for history. And uh, 
what uh, what a great knowledge you have for presidential history. We were not able to stump you, so. <laughs> Well, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate this opportunity to be able to talk with you. All of you who are here are very engaged. I uh, was skimming the, the list of attendees earlier as you were signing on. A lot of very good friends there. Hello to all of you. And um, and, and I know we're, we're, we're concerned about the direction the nation is going in. And so thank you for being involved and, and, and trying to work for some solutions. Okay. Thank you, Mike. And uh, thanks for coming to the Tacoma Public Library event tonight and see more events at our website. And um, have a wonderful evening, everyone. Inauguration Day is next week. Watch Good it. Good night. Right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night.